<laughs> Welcome to the Serious Security Seminar for January 24th. Today we're honored to have our own Professor Wojtek Spankowski with us. Uh, Wojtek has a doctorate from Gdansk University where he also spent some time as faculty, uh, also was at McGill University before joining us here at Purdue. Uh, a, Wojtek is an IEEE Fellow as well as a recipient of the prestigious Humboldt Fellowship and will be talking to us today about what is information, uh, talking about going beyond information or beyond information theory. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. This is a very general talk and uh, I doubt we will agree on what is information, but I would like to present to you some truths. And we, I will go through uh, uh, some uh, characterization of information and maybe we end up at the end of better understanding of information and I want to show you that information is studied not only in computer science, but also in physics, economy, uh, and biology, chemistry, and I would like to show you that information is actually everywhere and it is worth studying. So what is information? I think the best way it was characterized by Carl uh, von Weizsäcker, who made two statements that actually, at least for me, give a very, correct, a very good characterization of information, especially two properties, relativity and rationality. He said that information is only that which produces information. The best, I think, to explain it is through a very simple example. Imagine two guys sitting in a cafe uh, drinking a coffee, and one actually will continue drinking coffee, and the other guy is actually waiting for a message which tells him at what time a train or a bus will depart. And imagine that the message comes, and then observe activity of these two guys. The first guy, it doesn't matter what the message contains, will not change his activity. This message which not, will not produce any information for the guy whose objective activity is to drink a coffee. Why? There will be a, 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 a significant, a, a major change in the activity of the first guy depends what the message contains, what time it arrives, and where it arrives. So if, if it arrives at 5 o'clock and it says the train departs at 4 o'clock, you can imagine that this message does not actually contain much useful information because it's too late. So timing is important. If actually this message arrives not to the restaurant that the guy is sitting, but to another restaurant, so the space aspect of the information, that it also will not be good. It will be different information. So this is a relativistic aspect of information. It depends on the activity of the recipient. There is another aspect, rationality, a rational aspect of the message. Weinsacker say information is only that which is understood. If I will speak in Polish now, I think you won't, you won't understand too much, you as a recipient. However, I will be delivering the same message. And uh, uh, Feynman actually making a very simple state, statement, which was very convoluted here, but he says the following, information is not simply a physical property of a message. It is a property of the message and your knowledge about this. His example is actually very simple. He says if you are waiting for an information about your paper accept and rejection, and you get an email, the first line tells you everything. I regret or I'm pleased. You know, the whole message is there because you have prior knowledge and this is actually used to discover information contained in the message. Actually, information is physical also and actually physicists study it for 100 years and surprisingly information can do real work, can move this table if I have enough information. I will try to convince you by a hypothetical a thought experiment of Schiller later during the talk. Wheeler, who was, by the way, supervisor, PhD supervisor of Feynman, he was a guy who coined the term uh, black holes. On his 90th birthday, he was asked to present to the audience, to the, his students, 
five big questions of science, big questions of science that will shape science for the next 50 years. His fifth problem was it from bit. He was telling us that we have to study information in generality, its physical aspects as other aspects. Shannon, the only guy who actually single-handedly produced the most uh, successful and beautiful information theory, he did it by making one simplifying but very important assumption that semantics for communication doesn't matter. And for communication, information theory produces wonders. We hear computers, and what we are doing is actually because Shannon was telling us how to uh, uh, ship information faithfully. However, the semantic aspect actually haunts us because we still don't understand information containing shape and biology. These are two very important statements. I would say this is tells us why we have to go beyond Shannon. Uh, Frederick Brooks, he, for the 50th anniversary of JCN, he wrote a three to two page paper, three great challenges of 50 years old computer science. And here what he said, yes, Shannon did wonder, wonderful thing for us, and this is probably the most beautiful, at least for me, theory, some compare Shannon to Einstein. He produced good metrics of information in communication system, but we do not have any metric that will tell us how much information is contained in shapes, in structures. We all agree probably that a car is more complex than a bike. More complex means contains more information, but can you quantify it? No, but we have to quantify now how much information is contained in molecules, in, uh, if we want to understand information transfer in living cells. We, at least for DNA and proteins, we have to start studying information embodied in structures, and we have to find some good metrics for this. For many reasons, because even to, to fight diseases like uh, bad cow diseases, which is a structural disease, we have to understand what is a good structure, what is a bad structure, and how much information is contained. Actually, Marfred Eigen, a laureate and a Nobel winner in biochemistry, he actually said very well that the differentiable characteristic of the living system information, except it is not Shannon information, it's something else. It's a Darwin type of information. And I will try to tell you a little bit what I mean by this. We, since my last talk in October, actually, we make a little bit of progress understanding what the difference between Shannon and what Darwin information. Uh, uh, but definitely we need to go beyond Shannon, even if it was so successful. So, summarizing, there are four aspects of information that we must take into account. Relativity, rationality, timeline, and then space. This example, I hope, convinced you that these are important things. And if somebody would like to make a very informal definition, we can say that information is that what can impact a recipient ability to achieve the objective of some activity within a given context. It's in English, not math, but at least it gives us, in this sentence, we contain all relevant aspects of information, uh, uh, activity, objective, and context. Information is not absolute. Uh, it depends on all of this aspect plus many few, uh, few more that we will discuss a little later. Okay, can we try to make it a little more formal? Okay, here's one attempt. Let's go to even driven paradigm when we assume that all the world is populated in systems, whether it is a living cell, uh, cell or, or software agent or communication network. And uh, such a system is characterized by a state, usually vector space memory context, the number of customers waiting to a teller in a bank, the number of jobs waiting to be printed, and so on and so on. And actually, the state of the system is changed when an event occurs, arrival of a new customer or departure of a job just being printed. Everything actually occurs within a context, and the context could be time and space, actually. And this is important, so we would like to somehow involve context in our definition. And actually, every event has attributes. For example, when a, when a, a job arrives to a printer, 
it carries information how, uh, how long it takes to be printed. Or the arrival time is an attribute. So all of this, and there is a goal. The systems want to do something. And there is objective which we will characterize as a mapping into some well-defined space, let's say real numbers. For example, we can, so uh, objective depends on the rule of conduct. Sometimes, for example, for some system, we might require that I have to receive this, the same information twice in order to do something. So the rule of conduct contacts, an objective is some function into well-defined space, let's say real numbers. And having this objective well-defined, I think we can come up with a very general, almost useless, but very general definition of uh, information. I told you that information has to change activity. So it has to change, in some sense, objective. So, oh, I think I'm, ah, OK. I have to give you first few examples. I'm one slide ahead of you. OK, let me, let me illustrate uh, this uh, system, paradigm system, uh, in two examples. First will be very important distributed aspect of information that I guess nobody will still understand what it is. I claim one bit here locally and one bit there this in distributed system is a different bit of information. Uh, uh, to illustrate it, imagine that that this key, they will they basically wander on the network until they arrive in the washroom. The problem is that one key doesn't open the same at all. You need both keys at the same time, in the same space, in order to change the activity. How much information is in such a system? Locally, when I have these two bits together, I know I have one bit of information. But if these two bits are somewhere in the space, Somewhere, uh, I call it distributed one bit. Is it one bit locally and one bit distributed? Uh, 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 is the same bit of information? Can we somehow define it? I believe because we don't have good understanding of this, we don't have a good theory of networking, at least information theory for networks, because we don't understand the timeliness and spatial aspect of information and distributed aspect of information, that is still most, probably the most important uh, part of information that we have to understand and move forward. While an archive network is actually something that we need right now, new information to go beyond Shannon. I will tell you later that Shannon never considers space and, and time, actually. There's a new aspect. And in, in wireless computing, as well, by the way, networking. If I send one bit, one bit, channel bit of information over a network, and whether it arrives in one second or five hours, we will say it's one bit of information sent on the set. But we know that this bit of information is not the set. It contains different information when it arrives after five hours uh, uh, than, let's say, within five seconds how we can account for this. And why is computing a different aspect? When two users are closer to each other, they can send more information to that far apart. And you can ask all kinds of questions for why is computing that we don't understand and we have to understand. What is the speed of information? I will claim that information is distributed in the speed of sound, not of light. I will tell you why in a second. So it, 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 there is a lot of question, and actually during this talk you will listen, you will have a lot of questions, you will have very few answers. Finally, whatever I say in classical words doesn't hold in quantum words. And I will, I will avoid talking about quantum mechanics, but basically Pauli explained to us that any attempt to measure property destroyed our knowledge about, at least partially, and because of this, information, quantum information means something else, but we won't go there in order to uh, finish it within one hour. Okay, now we are ready to give you uh, 
uh, an attempt or an attempt to define information. I told you the information has to change activity within some rules of conduct <coughs> within some context. So information is carried by an event. So if we can measure uh, the difference of the objective before the event occurred and after the event occurred, and this cost could be anything, it is an information. It is information because information is not absolute and it depends on the context, on, even, on, on, the, on the rule of conduct, on the objectivity, on many other things. I will say very little about this, but we can assume that the maximum information that you can uh, contain within a certain set of rules and context could be defined capacity, but I will not go through this. One thing that I want to make sure that you understand, that when I define information, I'm assuming that there is no noise. Just for simplicity of, uh, of this discussion. Okay. So I tell you a very, very general definition. Now what Shannon did, and what actually, how within this framework that I just described, we can define uh, information. Shannon said, OK, first of all, semantic doesn't matter. What is objective in Shannon? In Shannon's uh, uh, information theory, objective is statistical ignorance of the recipient or statistical uncertainty of the recipient. If, for example, I'm the recipient and I know that you have two or three messages to send to me, let's, let's go first to extreme. If I know there's only one message, when I receive the snatches, there is no information sent because I know what the message is. I'm assuming that I know the set of messages that you want to send. If, there are, if you have two messages, uh, one ma you, you, if you can send one of two, or one of a thousand, observe that when a me message arrives to me, when it is one of a two, I'm, I'm gaining something. But it's like 50-50 I can get. When it is one of a thousand, when I get this one message out of a thousand possible, it seems to us that we gain more information. And that is actually Sherman postulate. He claimed that information, that statistical ignorance of the information depends on the probability of this event carrying information to be generated. So P of E, probability of generating E, in general it does not, not need to be uniformly distributed. What is the cost that I describe in my general definition? It's actually number of binary decisions to describe E. So Shannon defined information in a very simple way Lock of the probability of the event. This is called self information of event i. If you do averaging over all possible, uh, you get such a formula. And most of you know that it's entropy. Why it is called entropy? I will tell you a story a little later. Uh, how von Neumann convinced uh, Shannon to call it entropy. By the way, if there is noise, instead of information, I should talk about inf mutual information, but I won't be using it, so I will just drop it. Observe, by the way, that Shannon information theory in no way is absolute, because if I just take this one and try asking to compute information contained in this page, we won't agree, because you will be counting symbols or words to compute your probability, and I decide to look at shapes of the letters. And we all get different information. So there is no absolute meaning of information in this sense. Uh, so what actually Shannon did? Uh, before this, uh, we have to understand, have a better intuition about entropy. What is entropy? An example will tell us. So let's assume that I have eight messages to send with this probability. And I decided to use a code. This is a smart code. Because when I compute the, ever, the shortest length, uh, the length of this code, so I multiply one half by one, one four by two, and so on, I get two bits. If you compute actually entropy of this source, it's also two bits. The question is, is a coincidence or not? How short a description, on average, let's say, of a message, is related to the entropy? Actually, Shannon proof in his first theorem and uh, there is no blackboard, but in one line I can show it to you how to prove that 
the shortest, on average at least, the shortest description of a message has to be bigger than entropy. So in a sense, entropy is a quintessential uh, characterization of information content. You don't need, by the way, much more, one more bit more, even less actually, to find it so sh So if I ignore, by the way, natural, uh, 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 the uh, rounding, of uh, uh, this must be uh, an integer, then actually I can prove to you that the best can do is equal to the entropy of the so. So the more complex x is, the longer is, uh, the longer is description, the bigger is entropy, and the more information is there. Assuming that we somehow equate entropy information, which we can debate. Okay, so there are three results of Shannon, 48 that uh, in shape is the start with actual information theory. The first one I already told you, it's about data compression, short in description. It basically tells us that we cannot compress more than the entropy on average, but also for individual sequences, except for very few atypical uh, cases. So you cannot do better than this. But here's the jewel and the problem, in a sense, of Shannon result. So what you say, OK, if I want to say information over a channel, and there is a noise, this time noise is important. Of course, I would like to pump into the channel as much information, as many bits as possible. But because of the noise, if I send too much information, I might receive a lot of errors on the other side. So the question that Shannon asks is, what is the maximum bit rate? How many bits per second I can send in a noisy environment to receive faithfully, almost without error, the message on the receiver side? And he says there is this number, so there is this phase transition. Up to a certain number called capacity, you can send information as much as you want. If you send your information bit rates over the capacity, there is a positive probability of error, and you, you you most likely won't be able to send. There is a limit. However, there is one thing that Shannon just put under the rug, but it's very important. And uh, he said, OK, I can design a code. This code can be very long one to send this information. What does it mean? It means that before I send it in your message, I have to build a code, which means my delay might be very, very long. So time aspect, delay aspect, in this result is completely ignored. And now it was good for communication 50 years ago. Right now, why is computing? And if we want to go to economics, if we want to go to uh, biology and chemistry, we have to somehow deal with, with, uh, with uh, the, the time aspect of information. So actually, we'd like to have, OK, what is the maximum number of bits that I can send, provided that the delay is smaller than something? Can you answer this question? Finally, Shannon also generalized his result to the situation like uh, continuous signals that you have to uh, put aside. And it's just, OK, if I'm making that many errors, how much information I have to send? But we will concentrate on trying to understand this a little better and see what can be done. So in 2005, I organized the information beyond Shannon workshop. We have about 20, 30 people, and we debated. So what are the aspects of information theory that we would need to generalize now in order to move forward? I think I convinced you that delay is one of the things. I still don't understand how to characterize distributed bit, distributed information, or how, how can I characterize how much information is contained in a message that arrives two days after it was sent. Somehow, it would be good uh, to have a good characterization of this. I would prefer it not using utility function. Space is another aspect that I already mentioned to you, and actually uh, in a distributed aspect, a special aspect of information, the one very important in many, many applications. Control is the other. I think this statement characterizes more or less uh, uh, where we are. Information is exchanged in space and time. We all agree on this for decision making. Thus, timeline is an information delivery along with reliability and complexity constitutes the basic objective. So, how within this context 
to define, to extend uh, uh, shallow information and try to bring, use it in, uh, in why it could be the actually dark path with 50 million dollars for a project that unfortunately we didn't get. But actually to try to understand this math aspect, what is the capacity of information channel within this company? Dynamic information, that is something that also we need to know if those of you who are doing biology know that what is very fashionable right now is dynamic network, cellular networks, when actually uh, not only structural aspect of the network, but also a dynamic uh, aspect of the network, stability, robustness, uh, uh, timely delivery of messages are very important, not only for computer networks, but actually for living cells. Uh, that part is pretty much neglected, and uh, we have to move and attack them if we want to move forward with our understanding of information. Okay, that is new thing that since last time I talked in October, uh, uh, we, uh, we try to understand and build a very simple model where we can understand information. The first two will be probably difficult for me to describe, but here is my try, because we need too much background. But basically, the simplest model that Shannon has the following. I have one bit to send, zero and one. And when I send it over a channel, every bit with probability epsilon can be switched from zero to one, from one to zero. This is the probability. How much information I can deliver in such a channel? This is called binary symmetric channel. And I want to maximize over what? Over all possible distribution of transmitting zero and one. How much? It's very easy. It's an elementary problem. One minus entropy of epsilon. But now we want to introduce time into this. So let us show now that when I send my bit, actually my bit is delivered to the recipient within, uh, uh, with, uh, the, uh, there is a time attack on every delivery of the message. And for example, if the bit is not delivered before a certain deadline, the information sign is zero. We can, we can make it more complicated. How much, capacity, how much capacity is there? Actually, we probably what we have to do, we have to maximize over all possible distribution of delay. We don't know how to do it. Some we can, some not. Spatial aspect. My uh, recipient actually is not in one position, but can randomly move to many positions, and the signal that is uh, delivered there actually might be too weak to the information be recovered. How much information is there? Here's something that when we wrote recently our grant information transfer biology, we come up with a model, we call it a Darwin channel. And actually, this is an open problem information theory. Actually, every of this box is a big pro open problem information theory, even if we study for 50 years. So what, what basically is a simple description of biology is you have mutation, blind mutation, you change your uh, uh, bits, uh, uh, whether mm, mm, proteins or, or DNA. But that's not it. And mostly what mutation does actually is delete or insert letters. So let's consider deletion. So what it does is delete certain nucleotides or certain uh, uh, amino acids. And then Darwin selection process comes. So it, will not, it does not allow every mutation to pass through. Certain mutation will not survive, will be killed. What does it mean? We have two channels. The first channel is very simple. You have input sequence of 0 as 1, and you delete some of them. You don't know which one. And your output is here. How much capacity this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this channel has? How much information I can send? This is an open problem. Nobody knows. Second, Darwin selection, I told you that as input, it doesn't take every input. It takes only a subset of input. This is called constrained input. So actually, with magnetic recording, it is well no problem to constrain the channel, which is also not a problem. 
So instead of getting all binary sequence of length 0 to 1, which we have 2 to the power of n, I will make a restriction. I will say that certain sequences are not allowed. For example, if I have runs of 0, it has to be of certain length between, let's say, d and k, between 2 and 5. I have to either have 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, but not 6. The capacity of such a channel is unknown. I think we know why it is unknown, and I think we actually know what's going on. Uh, and the problem is very difficult. It reduces the top level of exponent, the random matrices, and many, many things here. But this is here we have some bounds. We know very little. And we would like, actually, to understand how much information we can send in such a system, which I believe will contribute to diversity, biodiversity. Distributed information I already mentioned to you. So uh, I don't understand what is the difference between one bit here and one bit somewhere there. Uh, until it comes to me, is the time required to deliver this bit to me? Should be somehow involved in the definition of information? No, I don't know. Speed of information, I told you that maybe speed of actual information is is propagated in the speed of uh, uh, sound, not light, and here in light. Take wireless computing, this is not my model, it's my colleague model, Philip Jacquet. Imagine that when you have your users that are com connected components, they do not touch each other. With the connected component, you can deliver a message very fast in the time in light of speed. But you have, when you have disconnected components, when you want to send information from this user to this user, in order to do it, this connected component will move slowly. And when they touch each other, then you can deliver a message. So what you need, you have movement of clusters. And whenever they touch each other, you send information to the other cluster, connected component, and you have to wait until you can deliver something from here to here. This will actually reminds me of the situation in which sound is, is, is uh, spread out in water, because my understanding is what happened, water molecules, the, the way the sound was spent, spread, you actually have, they have to touch into each other in order to, uh, to uh, transmit sound. So actually, you can mathematically prove that in this example, speed of information is uh, is much closer, actually equal, if we this, this agree on certain definition, the speed of sound. Structure, we know very little, and we know that in in gene networks and uh, and in in the shape of molecules in, in in chemistry, we don't know how to measure structure. This is, I think, one of the most important aspects that we have to go forward. The other thing which related probably to this audience uh, security, suspicious activity, is my Gatala, who discussed this recently, and actually might come up with a very nice model. Uh, and the idea is the following. Okay, we have massive data, whether it is DNA, or it is locked-in file, or whether it is KMI data, or, or Walmart data, whatever it is, or bank data. There are some relevant information to your query. And actually, certain, think about Google, okay? When you do a query, you will receive a lot of junk and very little information. So actually, this massive data situation was happened. You want to, to, you want to get relevant, useful information, and probably certain a subset of symbols of whatever you deal with will help you to extract this information, and all the other uh, 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 symbols are actually have to be treated as noise. The problem is that I cannot uh, uh, dig out information from the, the protein database is because it is too big, and most of the thing is completely irrelevant to my query. So how can you filter out somehow, and how we define in this case, what is information you want is not. And uh, there, this is actually, this is relevant for the definition of information within the context of massive data. 
We don't know yet how to do it, but at least we have one model that might help us to understand it a little better and probably you know, to do something. Okay, physics of information. Physicist actually thought about this, and entropy was not introduced by Shannon, as you know. It was introduced by Boltzmann. Boltzmann entropy for gas, let's say, was uh, denoted by S, let's say, is log of the number of states, number of microstates for molecules. Bigger W is, the bigger it is, uh, the bigger S is. K is just a unit constant that uh, we don't care. Uh, so why Shannon actually use the same name? Actually, Shannon didn't know how to call his function, and he asked from Neumann, probably one of the greatest or the fastest mathematicians of the 20th century. And for one, I told him, call it entropy because nobody understands what it is. <laughs> and in a sense, he was right and introduced a lot of confusion. But we will see that actually Boltzmann entropy and Shannon entropy are the same within the context. So uh, Boltzmann wanted to find out how molecules are distributed within a container of a given capacity. And let's follow his uh, thought a little bit. So let's assume that I have n molecules within, uh, 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 within a, 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 a given uh, a, a space. And let's assume that every molecule, so I divide this space into small uh, cells of size n. And within that, uh, this, uh, this uh, cell is very small. So within this cell, I do not care how the molecules are distributed, and the energy is more or less fixed. So I have total number of molecules in n, total energy is E, on how many ways I can distribute this molecule within this n cell. So if uh, if I would allow to permute molecules within a cell, it would be n factorial. But I'm telling you that the cells are so small that, I'm allowed, that any permutation within the cell is irrelevant. So I have to divide by n1 factorial and 2 factorial and n factorial with n sub i, the number of molecules within a cell. Okay? And we assume for simplicity that energy within the cell is the same. So what an, uh, an, uh, Boltzmann asked, which distribution is most likely to occur within this, such a simple model? And his answer was, the distribution that will occur is the one that make W as big as possible. So let's try to do it. Let's follow Boltzmann. So let's compute W asymptotically, of course. I take log W, I apply the uh, Stilling formula. And after some manipulation, I will get this one, which is nothing else, as the entropy, except that this is an optimization problem, max this subject to this. It turns out that the best one solution is when the, within a cell you have the same number of molecules, so uniformly distributed. In fact, when you take Shannon entropy and you maximize it, it maximizes when the distribution is uniform. And that's what we are getting again. So in a sense, Boltzmann entropy is a Shannon entropy uh, that maximizes the number of <coughs> all possible ways in which molecules can distribute. You probably heard about second law of thermodynamics, which tells, you, tells us that, uh, uh, that entropy cannot decrease. So if I take this bottle, if it is uh, and I uh, fall it, uh, okay, let me take some, uh, something else so that it can break, then the entropy, let's say, of a cup before I break it, is much smaller when it falls and breaks up. Why? Because the description, remember, entropy is related to description. The description of a cup, of a cup is relatively simple, but it's much harder when it breaks into many pieces. So the complexity of the description is much it's more complicated, so the entropy increases. And uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is more of a second law of thermodynamics. But Maxwell came up with a very, uh, 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 very uh, interesting thought experiment. He said the following. I have a container, and I have a demon who has a, a trap or a door. 
And what, it, what the demon does, it looks at the molecule, and those molecules that are very fast, it let it go to the left side, so it will be much hotter here than here. Of course, we do it in a path of constant temperature and many other assumptions. But observe that after, by the way, infinite amount of time, you will get a very funny distribution. There will be more hot here than here. This means, by the way, that the entropy actually decreases. Entropy of this compared to the entropy when all molecules are distributed with the whole container is much smaller. This would violate second law of thermodynamics. Since 18 something hundreds, when Maxwell came out with the solution, fed into many and actual information theories and computer science were thinking how actually this cannot happen. And I think the thing that is relevant to us was Shira in 1928, if I remember. He came up with a very interesting solution that actually show us that information is somehow related to energy and information can produce energy. And the bottom line is here, but let me describe his idea. So what uh, Shira say, okay, let's have one molecule, only one, but I don't know whether it is on the left side or on the right side. Let's assume that a genie, a demon, uh, an intelligence comes and tells you that the molecule is on the right. Then Shiller say, okay, replace this, div the, 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 it was the divider, okay, some uh, the divider, replace it with a piston. Keep it everything in the temperature, constant temperature. What this molecule does will be bumping this piston. And after infinite amount of time, this piston will move up here. So capacity V will be extended to capacity to volume 2V. If you remember from high school, a uh, formula for free energy it is something like K times N, number of molecules, times temperature T times log, finite volume to the, or, uh, to the uh, uh, initial volume, and here is 1. So actually, by knowing where this molecule is, by the way, I can adjust to this piston uh, through a, a, a weight here, and when this piston will move, it will actually inch my weight a little up, so actually a real work will be done. And you can see that in this hypothetical situation, one bit of information, acquiring one bit of information equivalent to t times t, if you want log 2, 2 coming from the log 2, uh, two times, uh, because the volume at the end is twice as big as the volume at the beginning. Acquiring information actually requires, uh, 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 requires energy, and that how it is used to actually explain maximum demand. But before it happened, Landa were okay, and in 68, he told us what, is the, what are the energetic limits for computation. And he, uh, a very beautiful actual theory that together with Bennett they developed, he observed uh, that there are certain operations that can be logically irreversible and logically irreversible. And he was saying that those that are logically irreversible, which are also, or he proved physically irreversible, then this operation in our computer will generate heat. And actually, in order not to violate second law of thermodynamics, one bit of information will actually produce about k to log 2, that's what I showed you on, on, on previous slide, energy. Actually, the interesting thing was that he proved that storing one bit information, reading one bit information, and transmitting one bit information does not require energy. You can build a reversible, a reversible computation that will not require, hypothetically, any energy. The entropy will be disseminated only if I erase information. And then I come up with explanation to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Maxwell Demon. He said, OK, Demon has to observe molecules and has to have a tape, a storage, when we'll uh, Draw information about velocity of different molecules. 
At the beginning, the stem is a random state. So we'll be writing this information about speed of molecules. But from time to time, he has to actually, so we have, you start with a random tape. This is an easy way to explain it. From time to time, he has to, has to write a new information. He has to change 1 to 0. In order to do it, he first has to erase 1 and then store 0. But when he's erasing, he is disseminating entropy. So a system that contains of the container uh, 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 plus Okay, I don't know if I find. Okay, no, that's not the way to go. The system, container molecules plus demo together. If you compute entropy, you will find out that it actually increases. So we are okay. Uh, uh, everything is fine. We have about five ten minutes, I guess. So let me go through three quickly three examples. I start believing, and I say something that I shouldn't, but I will, that uh, biology, which is wonderful science, of course, but it's still it was in pre-Newtonian uh, stage, when, when physics was before Newton actually developed his theory. That's not my thing, by the way. Somebody else made a statement. Because if you think about how many theories do we have in biology, probably Darwin is the only theory that we have. We have a lot of collection of facts. And of course, people, uh, people are trying to uh, put these facts into bigger theory. The problem is that life is extremely complicated. It's much more complicated than the real world that we observe. For many reasons, like quantum uh, mechanics, quantum world is much compli complicated. But I think we agree that in a sense, what happened in cell, living cell, is like some kind of a dance interplay between energy, entropy, and information. Information is cells, living cells can die, but information doesn't. It is not physical parties. So there is, in living cells, there is something that I call information transfer. And perhaps the needed abstraction to build Theory around, bi around biology could be actually trying to understand information transfer in living cells. Here's one example. Uh, I just learned this from my son. Uh, so you have a, a cell with the nucleus, and actually there are microtubule transports. So there are certain, for example, mitochondria that are either transmitted from the nucleus to the boundary of the cell or uh, reverse. It turns out that this transfer, when it happens, it is not a smooth transfer. Actually, it is zigzag. And they are trying to understand why. OK, maybe, well, here is the conjunction, maybe the reason that uh, uh, we have uh, something that is information transmitted is so because Timing is everything uh, when transmitting information within cell, and actually you have to deliver that information at a given time, within a given range of time, because otherwise it's, it, it will probably destroy cell. Look, if this is very hot, and I'm trying to touch it, if this information about this hot is not delivered to my brain within a time, within a certain range, it will be a complete disaster. So actually, information living cell is definitely related to timing. So we have to understand this aspect. And we cannot understand it in the simpler sense. Other thing, uh, we know very well the certain parts of DNA and other uh, protein, whatever, uh, are better conserved than the others. <coughs> Why? Because there is a Darwin selection and so on. But perhaps. There is something else also. If you consider extra exon part and neutron part, neutron part is non coding for exon part than genes are, and genes are much better preserved. Maybe this intron part has a lot of bits that actually what they do, they correct. So, like error correcting code that we have when we transfer information from one computer to another, maybe they actually uh, uh, are able to correct certain error that occurs within, within uh, the, the biological sequence. We don't know. 
is it a, a, any way to actually study it? We are writing a small paper about this, but we try to, to understand mutual information for different parts of DNA, and it seems to me that there is some statistical dependency between exons and neutrons, which might indicate that there, are, there is something there. Information chemistry probably is storing shape and structure. Here are two examples that actually in mechanic and many other fields of study, crystalline structure and muscular structure. This is very uh, 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 easy to describe. It has low entropy. This, by the way, when it is very random, there is a long rate dependency. It has much higher uh, entropy and much more information. Can we find a, a, a way to measure this entropy containing structures? A graph entropy, if you are asking, is not the right way to go. Because graph entropy describes maybe complexity of connectivity, but not complexity of the structure. So we don't know. But this is one thing. I will skip this. But basically, information can be measured in many ways. In economy, information measures dollars. Uh, and information is basically, it is called value of information. The difference in economic rewards of informed action versus uninformed action. And actually, there is a difference between amount of information, entropy, and value of information. This depends on the payoff function, depending on the action and decision. And here you, you can have one definition that is a difference between the best decision that you can do for every action. So the maximum amount of decision maker would pay. Minus, let's say, uh, 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 the, the, the best possible overall decision without knowing which action actually you can take. And actually, there is there's a lot of work in this. And by the way, February 12th, we have a speaker from Bana Champagne for our lecture series of scientific information. They will be talking about information and economics. You are very welcome. Uh, uh, to attend, it will be, uh, maybe I will have a slide about this later. Okay, when we go to quantum, everything collapses. Uh, and actually, the simplest question, we have a conservation of energy, we have conservation of this and that. Is it a conservation of, of, of information? I would say that if I leave unfinished paper in my computer, unfortunately, when I come back tomorrow, it won't be finished. Information will not flow in. I have to write and finish this paper. Perhaps what can happen that uh, because of some uh, errors and uh, noise, that actually information can, uh, uh, can actually be uh, evaporated in the environment. So in one sense, in some sense, there is no conservation of Information, but if we go to quantum computing and we agree uh, and we accept the coherence, the coherence is basically flowing information to surrounding objects that happen very quickly, within 10 to minus 20 seconds. Then actually some physicists believe that information uh, is conserved. We don't know. It's, it's, it's a basic question that we don't know. So there are today challenges. Definitely, we need to understand structure organization and metrics for information there. We need time, space, and control because we need it for wireless computing, biological application, and so on. When you go from microscopic, uh, uh, microscopic in microscopic where shallow postulates do not have, actually, shallow defined entropy through three postulates. And the third postulate does not work in quantum work. Uh, but in massive data, these two things are very important. Uh, 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 that, uh, first of all, uh, 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 the rate at which information is sifted is much bigger than we can handle. And actually, information, the massiveness of data is the overhead and noise. We have to define a new model of noise in order to understand it. Uh, in many aspects, uh, rational and non-cooperative behavior will be important. I will have impact of all of this. I think this is one of the last transparent. So it looks like studying information is fun, is important, and we don't know too much. We have a very good, uh, 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 wonderful, rigorous shallow information that makes wonders and, uh, 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 and a lot of uh, contributions, good contribution in information theory. 
But I think we need to go to signs of information, which will be, we will look at this in much broader sense. And maybe uh, one suggestion is that maybe we should try to start something like Information Science Institute. Some of you probably got email from me inviting you to just to join this uh, initiative and we'll probably meet in February and try to see what to do. We might go and try to have some uh, center with some other universities. Uh, a okay, lecture series of science information, I don't think yeah, it should be you. Uh, maybe it will work. Let me see if it will work. Okay, probably not block. Okay, hello. So I ah ah okay. Lee, here it is. Wonderful. So uh, last year we have three talks: uh, information series, computer science, and physics. Uh, starting this spring, we'll continue it. Nicolas Janel is, is, a, is a, an economist from Urbana Champaign, and he will call about contracts under asymmetric information. Andrew Baron is a very well known information theory statistician within Yale. And Madhu Sudan, I don't think I have to introduce him to computer scientists. He is actually now a winner, and he will talk about our universal semantics for communication. So these are three talks of different aspects of science. Hopefully, will bring us uh, better understanding about information and maybe move it forward. Let's get finished here. Let's, if we have one short question, let's, let's take time to do that. And if there is a short question. Okay, thank you thank very much. You. Thank you.